This is AutoLine This Week, the show that gets you inside the global automotive industry. AutoLine This Week partnered with the Consulate General of Canada in Detroit to produce this episode. Thanks for joining us on AutoLine this week. Today's topic is all about the shortages that are hitting the industry. You've probably all heard about the microprocessor chip shortage that is crippling production worldwide. There's other shortages potentially out there as well. And so we're going to talk today about rebuilding new supply chains. And I've got three great experts to talk about it, including Carla Bailo, the CEO for the Center for Automotive Research. Julie Freem is the CEO of the Original Equipment Suppliers Association, and Mark Wakefield is Managing Director at Alex Partners. And thank you all for joining us today. Julie, we know that there's a chip shortage going on right now. We know everybody's studying this issue. Is there anything that the automakers and suppliers can do to address it? Is there anything out there that they can do in the short term? Yeah, and you've hit the critical issue. It's the short term issue, short to medium term even. It, it's very difficult um, in terms of being able to address this quickly. Um, I think most of us know now we've learned more about semiconductors than we ever thought we would, but um, you know, the, supply, the uh, value chain takes 20 weeks or more sometimes uh, to create those chips. So short term, it's there's not a lot uh, that uh, the auto industry can do uh, to address this in a quick manner. Yeah, let's uh, get your input on that, uh, Carla Bailo at the Center for Automotive Research. Uh, anything that you look out as you survey the landscape that can be done in the short term? They're really, I, Julie hit it perfectly correct. I mean, there's really not a lot that can be done in the short term. What you do is you try to balance the products that you have, you try to make sure you keep those plants running that have the the in-demand vehicles, and uh, you know you you on the phone night and day to see where you can find some some chips. You also start changing specifications. We've seen the automakers doing that. Certain specs are not being built, and or others are being substituted in the different grades to just continue building and getting product out the door. Building the vehicles and putting them in storage and trying to retrofit is never a good idea. That's mm. the last case that you want to look at because as we know, that causes a plethora of quality issues. So it's a longer term solution we're looking at here. Mark at Alex Partners, you've studied this a lot. You came out with a study in January that said, it looks like the industry is going to lose $60 billion. You recently updated that. Now it looks like it's over a hundred billion dollars. So what advice do you have? Well, right now, it's just really getting through, as Carla and Julie were saying, getting through this crisis in the near term until orders start coming in. We've got you know, this challenge of not, visit, not having visibles to where these things are coming from and where they can go to. And so there's a lot of daily conference calls and there's a lot of hunting and pecking around for which, um, which thing is the right one to push on which vehicle it should go to in the tiers, understanding what my allocations are. And there's a lot of that ground game going on on a chip by chip or semi by semi basis. And a lot more understanding we have, of course, deeper into the chain. But the nice thing about this is this is sort of shocking the the model, the business into looking into the longer term, into the oh. building blocks of, of better visibility and a better future. Let, let, let's talk long term then, Mark. What What is your advice to the industry? Well, you definitely have to get visibility. And as Carla was saying, there's ways you can standardize uh, some chips, put more into software than necessarily onto the chip. There's a way you can delay the specification of when a chip becomes specific to a product. Um, but there's also just a fundamental realization that the, it's not three months for everything. And we learned this a long time ago in precious metals. There's a six month chain that has to be owned, that has to be understood. And so you're getting OEMs and tier ones getting much more engaged down to the fab level and to the test level. And that's a healthy thing because it's also educating people around what the real fundamental uh, supply chain time is. And so what one has to do is a release to get there. You know, hopefully we won't have this whipsaw of every plant in the world being down and coming back up and trillions of dollars put on in incentives effectively by making uh, demand boom faster than planned. So hopefully that won't happen again. 
but I think the industry's lost. I learned quite a bit about needing to get engaged uh, value stream by value stream and in semiconductors that it's not a three month affair. You need to plan out much longer term. And Julie, what, uh, sorry, go ahead, Carla. I was just gonna say, we've been talking about this for some time as well, thinking, looking at delving deeper into the supply chain, not just for a parts availability standpoint, but from a quality control standpoint. If you have a problem in a, in a component and you don't have a way to source that back down, it can sometimes take weeks to, to go back and find out where that problem initially started and then to batch or understand how big that problem is. So getting more visibility is not only going to help part shortages, but will also help with quality management. And Julie, your organization, OESA, represents virtually every supplier in North America. <laughs> what, what are they telling you? What, what are the plans that they're putting in place? Well, I want to touch on the uh, item that we were talking about in terms of what can the OEs do a, lo a little bit longer term, and then I'll circle back to the suppliers. Um, in addition to um, sort of looking at um, how they develop these products, uh, we need to recognize that the chip industry technology moves very quickly. And assuming that you're going to be able to use chips for 10, 15 years on a product is probably not a good assumption. And so uh, in terms of the development process that OEs and suppliers use, They've got to look at updating these chips and the technology that is used in these chips on a more frequent basis. And a, an example of that is we're using uh, something called a 180 nanometer chip right now. And that is standard and fundamental on many uh, different components within the auto industry. Well, the new investment going in from some of these uh, wafer and fab plants is at the you know, 12, 10 and 5 nanometer level. So you can, and it's moved sub, you know, through that. It didn't just jump from 180 to five. It's, it's gone through a number of iterations. So in, technically we're using old chips and, and that makes it harder because no one wants to invest more capacity in what's considered old technology. So we are really um, learning from an industry standpoint about how to, how to play in this marketplace as we move vehicles from, you know, me more mechanical to much more uh, um, of an uh, electrical system. From the supplier standpoint, I think what they're asking is for transparency from the OEs and transparency from the chip and wafer fab manufacturers. They're, in some ways, they're caught in the middle, right? They always want the chips and yet they don't have the visibility, um, real visibility down deep into the supply chain. And so um, to Mark's point earlier, we're really learning about how important that transparency is and how important the long-term commitments are in the chip industry. We've got to compete, you know, autos are less than 10% of the overall chip industry. We've got to com compete with the phones, the apples, the, you know, if we're gonna do that, we need to play the game like they play the game, which is long-term commitments, multiple year commitments um, in terms of the chip usage. So there's a lot we've learned. It's now we've got to change uh, how we do this. So much of chip manufacturing that used to be done in the US is offshored over the last several decades mm. is the solution producing more chips in the US. And I'm just talking about the US. It's, it, Europe is hit by the same situation too, by and large. You know, So much of chip production has uh, moved off to Asia. Is this something that the industry and maybe even the country should be looking at? From my standpoint, yes. And not just for vehicles, I think that's very important, but also for defense. I think there's an element of understanding and having that capability here in the United States that's important. And um, we need to recognize that and um, ensure that we're investing in that over the long haul. Mark, your thoughts. Uh, should we have more onshoring of chip manufacturing? Do you think it's going to happen? And what would it take to make it happen? Well, it looks like there's 52 billion that's trying to make some of that happen. But uh, I don't see it as critical. Honestly, I think you know this happened through a whipsaw of 
of demand and supply that was pretty unusual. And um, it would have happened, I think, a similar way had we had plants here in the U.S. too. Um, so I think putting the sort of national security defense things aside for the auto industry, we just need reliable supply. It's good to have multiple sources of it. It's even better, though, to have a good understanding, and the auto industry is now developing a better understanding of um, how we go back to ingot, how we get into you know the testing site, and we all we already kind of knew a fair bit about you know PCB assembly, but beneath that, that's what's valuable. Um, where exactly it's made, I think, is less important because I think if you went through a whole car, there's all sorts of materials that are quite specific to only a few producers and only a few locations. So it's a it's a bit of a a dream to hope that you'll you'll have a bit of everything made everywhere. Carla, let's talk more than just chips too, because this all applies to the move to electric cars. There's critical materials that go into the battery. There's critical materials that go into the electric motors. Mm -hmm. uh, we have not hit a shortage of that yet, but potentially another shortage is out there. What, what are your thoughts when it comes to the transition to electric vehicles from a critical material standpoint? We definitely have risk and never before has the skill of risk management been needed to really truly assess your supply chains, assess those critical materials and see where there may be risk, be it environmental risk, be it social risk, be it just, is there enough risk? When we look at the number of vehicles that the manufacturers are talking about um, producing by 2030, and we look at the amount of battery capacity we have today, we're woefully short. Mm -hmm. um, and you know you have to then plan that properly. But then if you dig even deeper and start looking at the lithium and the cobalt, and those materials and where they're mined today, look at the political landscape, look at how that is mined. All of that is going to reflect on the company utilizing those materials. So this risk management piece is so critical to then decide which supplies we need to think about doing ourselves, moving on shore. There's a number of different ways to manage that risk, but that has to be highlighted. And I think the industry overall needs to start talking about this together and begin to find these solutions rather than staying in their own on their own baseball field so to speak and not collaborating this is really time to come together because the consumer at the end of the day doesn't care where the cobalt came from or doesn't care where the semiconductor came from they just want to have something that works and is reliable and good quality yeah, julie under american capitalism it's kind of every company for itself get out there and compete but what do you think of uh, the issue that Carla raises there, that this is beyond any one individual company being able to have uh, reliable access to critical materials? Yeah, I, I agree. I think um, what you see the suppliers and the OE starting to do is make the list and understand what those um, critical materials are. We've hit on some of them, lithium, cobalt, et cetera. But it's really important that um, we have a plan and we address that as an industry. Um, and it may even, frankly, be broader than an industry. May, we may need to look across industries to understand what's the usage going to be and how do we support our manufacturing um, needs in the U.S. Uh, and ensure that we have that uh, ongoing supply. Uh, the Biden administration, Julie, as you know, uh, initiated a 100-day review of critical supply chains. Are you hearing anything from Washington and especially as it applies to the auto industry when it comes to ensuring that uh, the U.S. has access to these materials? That study is still underway. Um, we expect the report to go out on June 9th. Um, that's when it's due. Um, but yes, we are working with them and providing them information. I think what you'll see is that um, they are talking about the same things in that study as we're talking about right now um, in terms of what needs to be addressed. So um, we look forward to getting it and, you know, and hearing about it. But um, I think most of us have had the opportunity to at least give that input um, uh, as part of the study. So we'll see. Yeah, Mark, I'd love to get your thoughts on this. You know, as you, you raised the issue that as long as you have reliable access to these 
uh, and we were talking chips earlier, but uh, now uh, these critical materials, uh, th there is a, uh, a geopolitical uh, consideration at play here, isn't there? I mean, you know, the U.S. is so dependent on China for access, especially the processing of materials, and U.S. and China don't have the best relations going on right now, and you can imagine a situation where it could get worse and get uh, have the U.S. industry cut off. Yeah, I think that is that is a fair concern, particularly around batteries, particularly around the material going in, the cobalt and lithium. So I think on batteries, that's a particular concern, especially given the amounts of, of gigafactory level capacities going into China, now a sort of catch up going on in Europe. And the US doesn't, I mean, we've seen the Ford and the GM announcements, but there really hasn't been the same level of capacity being committed and being planned. And so I do think on the cell level, that's an issue. And, and we're working with clients today on how to get access to lithium in particular, uh, a little less so cobalt's kind of gone through its phases, but lithium absolutely right now. Uh, and so it really is top of mind. It is, as you were saying, more of each company for itself at the moment as they're planning through. Um, and so, you know, Julie's done some really great work organizing the industry together, and I'm hoping to see more of that uh, uh, from OESA. Mm -hmm. uh, but right now it's, it's very much um, each company for itself making its plans. And geopolitically, you do see the U.S. a bit behind on battery capacity plans. Carla, one of the reasons, you know, lithium production, there is lithium mines in the U.S., but most of it is as left because it's a dirty, nasty, environmentally bad thing to do by and large. And if you do want to do it in a more sustainable way, your costs go way up. Yes. Have you heard any talk of, you know, how we might be able to address this? Uh, can we do sustainable mining, for example? Well, it's really interesting because I've seen several Australian companies, which, as you know, a lot of the, the raw materials are actually mined in Australia and then processed in China. So they have a lot of capability in, in mining and mining sustainably. So they're starting to come here to the U.S. and starting to, to look and see what, what they can do with some of the veins that exist here. We know where the titanium is. We know where the lithium is. We know where the cobalt is. It's just not easy to get to or sustainable to, to produce. So I'm hoping what comes out of this study is, you know, good research initiatives to find a better way. There are ways to do it, and we have to we have to analyze those to make it safe, to make it healthy, to you know not damage our, our environment, and to be able to then um, you know refresh whatever it is we take away. So it, we need to do that better overall with a lot of the raw materials we're taking out of our earth today. Mm -hmm. But let's research it. We've got a lot of great uh, scientific brains here in the U.S. that have done a lot of research on these raw materials. And then let's listen to these companies that are currently doing it, and maybe they can help propel us with do's and don'ts with their knowledge. And let's be open to them coming here and working with us to make that happen. And Julie, let's pick that up. Uh, you know, mining's one thing, then you got to process all those materials to, to make them usable. And that can be a dirty, nasty business too, from an environmental standpoint. Uh, have you heard anything of doing a, a much cleaner processing of materials and onshoring that. Well, as Carla talked about, there are ways, it's the cost and the impact of that. And I think what um, we're all recognizing here uh, throughout the entire supply chain is that there's going to be a different trade-off between cost and or price in the, you know, depending on where you're sitting in the supply chain and the sustainability. And our, ultimately, the, the customers and are demanding a different trade-off. Um, and so we're going to have to figure that out uh, as an industry and be able to balance that in a different way than we have. Uh, I think it's clear that, you know, if you go backwards a bit, it's always been price, price, price. And that's not necessarily going to be the right answer as we look at some of these uh, sustainability issues um, going forward for vehicles. It doesn't sound like anything's gonna get resolved soon. I mean, if it's still being studied, let's say even the studies come out in, in you know matter of weeks here and 
It's, you know, I'll make sense. It's still going to take years to put in yeah. place, maybe, maybe more than years. You know, it might take a couple of decades to put this in place. I think you're right. <laughs> I mean, and, it, it, well, this is a long term problem. And, you know, what we have to guard against is kicking the can down the road and not addressing it. And so the, the challenge for the industry now is to take this, learn the lessons and begin to truly address these issues. We've had semiconductor uh, issues before. This is not the first shortage we've lived through. And so, it, you know, hopefully this time we'll, we'll pick that up and we will change how we do things. So we don't have to go through this one more time and relearn the lessons. It, it's it's future proofing, right? So we have to start future proofing, and we haven't really done that the best. You know, the the American Indians used to do that great. They looked at seven generations before they made a decision. A great story about that. But we don't tend to do that. We're looking for short term, short term profits, and not the long term sustainability. But this is not the wave of the future, and and we have to we have to change the way that we think about business. We're, we're going to be forced to do that by our shareholders who are not going to accept, you know, not looking at all of the other elements that go into that profit figure. It's, it's a full look now at how are you handling your social inequity issues? How are you handling your environmental issues? What is your carbon footprint? How are you rated? So all of this goes into your share price, which eventually comes into the value of the company as well. It's not just the profit that you make on every product that you sell. Mark, we've talked uh, lithium and cobalt. I think you could throw nickel in there. And we haven't even mentioned rare earth minerals. They're, they're an element in all this as well. Is there anything else out there that, you know, you're thinking, whoa, <laughs> here's something else we better keep an eye on? Well, it's good that we're thinking through each chain, really, and deciding what we need to do in long-term commitments, as Carla was talking about, and how to build in flexibility. And we're doing a lot of work with, with OEMs and suppliers on that now, because that is the sort of longer term build resiliency thing. And it goes through each one. Right now we've got teams looking for coils of steel <laughs> all around the world for specific coils. And that's steel, you know, you wouldn't have thought that would be so difficult. And, you know, helping teams get through rapid validations of using different steels. Um, and so we had the seed funds and alternate seed foams and things like this that, so it's it's really dealing with this um, this sort of spike that we've had to go through, and from those, I think that's exposed a lot of risk management. Where in the past you'd say, well, let's let the tiers deal with it and force them, um, you know, let's go for cost first. And I think you know once you start threatening an assembly plant's production, uh, it gets real to people about maybe we should take some longer term, more resilient risk management approaches. And so I don't think it's it's reserved to the EV nor to the semiconductor space. We're seeing it pretty broadly. Yeah, great points. Carla, you, you see anything else out there that we should be uh, keeping an eye on? Well, of course, the rubber shortage is here too, you know, and, and again, that just illustrates you, you really have to keep your eye on the ball where your materials are coming from and look at those raw material sources and analyze what's happening there. I mean, it's interesting to me, and I bring this case up quite often with the rubber issue, China started buying rubber a year ago. What are they doing? How are they analyzing that? And you know, somehow we're missing it. So again, it's a skill set of analyzing the data, knowing where everything's coming from, and then being able to assess and begin to, to future-proof yourself. Um, you know, the other big issue, of course, is um, looking at other materials, your titaniums, your aluminums, your magnesiums, as we have to lightweight our products more and more because the batteries weigh a lot. Um, those are finite resources, too, and we don't necessarily mine them here. So the, the complexity of materials is going to become more vast. And, you know, the, the looking at that and, and potentially, I keep saying we need to work together on some of these is really important. Yeah, Julie, we're going to end with you. We're down to the last minute and a half here. But mm -hmm. uh, uh, Carla raises a good issue. You know, China's approaching this as a country. We're not. You know, so maybe is that the reason why they're getting better analysis of potential shortfalls ahead? 
Certainly could be. Um, you know, they, they've looked at it from a broader perspective. Um, so uh, we need to consider that. Um, you know, you ask the question, what else is there out there that we're dealing with from a supplier community? And I'll be brief. Um, there's really two aspects that I also think we need to watch completely different than the raw material side. One is labor and the availability of labor that is impacting suppliers and um, really the entire nation right now in terms of that. And the second is transportation. Um, you know, the ports are backed up. We need uh, new, uh, more modern uh, regulatory um, items with regard to that. And we need, frankly, just more freight, more air freight um, and more truck freight. So I'll, I'll leave it with that. Well, that, that's a great note to, to wrap it up on. And boy, you guys have given me a whole lot to think about here. I really want to thank you for your insight, your analysis, and, and looking deep uh, into the supply chain and looking out into the future of what this industry has got to do. But with that, Carla Bailo, Julie Frame, Mark Wakefield, thank you much so much for your time today. And of course, I want to thank all of you out there who have tuned in to watch this. AutoLine This Week partnered with the Consulate General of Canada in Detroit to produce this episode.